yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Shortly after noon, the day following the attack, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed a still shocked and angry Congress, asking for a declaration of war. In less than an hour, by a vote of 437 to 1, the declaration was passed, and the United States was now a participant in World War II. That same day, back at Pearl Harbor, the sun rose through thick black smoke that blanketed the devastated harbor. The smoke was coming from the USS Arizona and the USS Shaw. These two ships would continue to burn that day and into the next. Wreckage was strewn everywhere. Firefighting crews were working nonstop and the grisly duty of recovering the dead was continuing. But the highest priority was assigned to the recovery of survivors. Rescuers working on the USS Oklahoma, the USS California, and the USS Utah could hear tapping coming from sailors who had been trapped in submerged compartments when the ships capsized. Crews with torches began cutting into the hulls of the overturned ships to reach the trapped sailors. In some cases, the acetylene cutting torches depleted oxygen from the submerged air pockets, unwittingly suffocating some men before they could be rescued. In others, once a hole was cut into the hull, trapped air in the compartments rushed out and was replaced by water, drowning the men. In all, 32 trapped men were pulled from the Oklahoma, two more were freed from the California, and one sailor was rescued from the Utah. The attack on Pearl Harbor had been the first step in the Japanese plan to expand into Southeast Asia and the South Pacific, and it had been a great success. But it was only one of many successes that Japan enjoyed on December 7th. Within hours of the air raid on Pearl Harbor, Japan also successfully attacked American territories of the Philippines, Guam, Midway Island and Wake Island, along with Malaya, Hong Kong, and Thailand. These coordinated attacks throughout the Pacific region were virtually unopposed and were followed by invasion forces. Soon, the Japanese invaders conquered Burma and Singapore, and by April controlled the prized Dutch West Indies. They had seized everything within their southern operation plan and had accomplished it ahead of the military planner's schedule. The defense line for their home islands now extended through Southeast Asia, New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands to the edge of the Indian Ocean and north through the Gilbert and Marshall Islands and Wake Island to the Aleutians. One particular American military action to counter these Japanese successes was a daring bombing raid over Tokyo in April 1942. As a direct response to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Colonel James H. Doolittle led 16 B-25 bombers on a mission to strike military targets in Japan. Because they had no access to airfields close enough to Japan, these bombers were launched in a surprise maneuver from the aircraft carrier USS Hornet which had closed to within 600 miles of Japan. Although the bombing raid achieved limited success, it was a great boost to American morale and a tremendous psychological shock to the Japanese, who considered their defenses impenetrable. Strategically, Doolittle's attack caused Japan to withdraw units from combat to defend the home island and strengthen Japan's resolve to destroy America's aircraft carriers. As a result of the Doolittle Raid and a naval setback at the Battle of the Coral Sea in the South Pacific, Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, the chief architect of the Pearl Harbor attack, hastily proposed a plan to the Japanese War Council to eliminate America's aircraft carriers. This plan involved an attack on the American-controlled Midway Island, the island farthest northwest in the Hawaiian island chain. The Japanese counted on the American Pacific Fleet to come to the rescue, and when they did, Yamamoto would ambush and destroy the fleet, 
including the carriers that had eluded him at Pearl Harbor. Yamamoto was a brilliant military planner, but he did not know that the United States had broken Japan's secret code and was able to interpret their radio transmissions. Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, knew in advance the time and the place for this attack. This vital information enabled Nimitz to position his fleet such that the United States won a stunning naval victory at Midway Island on June 4, 1942. In this battle, four of the six Japanese aircraft carriers that had participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor were sunk. This decisive battle was the turning point in the naval war for the Pacific. The Japanese Navy never fully recovered from this loss. Meanwhile, the American Pacific Fleet was performing a near-miraculous recovery. Many of the less damaged ships from the Pearl Harbor attack were put into dry dock, repaired, and returned to service. And over the next two years, the more seriously damaged ships were raised from the bottom of the harbor, temporarily patched, sailed back to shipyards on the west coast of the U.S. for an overhaul, and returned to sea. A massive effort went into writing and raising of the Oklahoma. Closer examination determined that the torpedo damage was too great to be repaired. Out of all ships sunk and damaged in the December 7th air raid, all but the Oklahoma, the Arizona, and the Utah were eventually returned to service. The Arizona and the Utah were both left in place as memorials to those that gave their lives for their country. The Oklahoma, which suffered the second greatest loss of life during the attack, was sold for scrap after the war, but sunk during a storm at sea while in tow to California. As devastating as the Pearl Harbor attack was, the fact these ships were so quickly put back in service points out some opportunities missed by the Japanese that day. A third wave attack had been planned, but was canceled at the last moment. Had the Pearl Harbor shipyards been targeted in a third wave, a quick recovery of the fleet would have been impossible. Had the Japanese targeted the 4.5 million barrels of oil stored in surface tanks around the harbor, the Pacific fleet would have been stranded without fuel for months and might have been unable to fully support the battle at Midway. In addition to these missed opportunities, perhaps the greatest miscalculation of the Japanese planners of the Pearl Harbor attack was the reaction of the American people. The shock, the rage, the indignity of an attack without warning ignited a fighting spirit in America never before seen. This outrage led to the adoption of the slogan, Remember Pearl Harbor, as the nation rallied to the war effort. Volunteers flooded recruiting centers, and America's industrial might geared for war. It was everybody's patriotic responsibility to support the war any way they could. Women took jobs left by men who went into the service and became an integral part of the workforce. Production had to be maintained. There were constant drives for scrap metal to be recycled into war materials. Gasoline, rubber, sugar, and other critical materials were rationed. Extra money went into the purchase of war bonds and citizens participated in regular blood drives. People also willingly accepted strict censorship of the news to and from overseas. All of this so that the boys in uniform would be as safe as possible and have everything they needed to fight the war. All Americans on the home front sacrificed for the war, some more than others. Americans of Japanese ancestry experienced extreme suspicion after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Even though they were Americans, a wave of prejudice and hatred engulfed the general population. Thousands of people from Hawaii and the west coast of the United States were thought to be sabotage risks and were therefore moved to internment camps in the interior of the country. Young Japanese American men serving in the military at the time of the attack, considered disloyal because of their ancestry, were summarily discharged from the military and reclassified as unfit for duty. In May 1942, the U.S. Army reversed this decision and returned to service Japanese-American men from the Hawaiian National Guard 
as the 100th Battalion. These soldiers were eager to prove their loyalty to their country and brought tremendous energy to the combat training. Their battalion motto was Remember Pearl Harbor. Because of the enthusiasm shown by the 100th Battalion, a second Japanese-American combat unit was created the following year, the 442nd Infantry Regiment. Both units served with distinction in the European theater, fighting bravely for nearly three years in Italy and southern France. Ultimately, the two units were combined into the 442nd, which emerged from World War II as the most decorated combat unit of its size in the history of the U.S. Army. The U.S. military effort to remove Japan's stranglehold on the Pacific began in August 1942, when American Marines landed at Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. In fierce fighting, they captured the island and a nearly completed Japanese airfield. This was the first of many fierce, island-hopping campaigns that would characterize the war in the Pacific over the next three years. These campaigns were to become some of the bloodiest in U.S. military history, involving beach landings, routing out entrenched enemy positions, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Under the direction of Admiral Nimitz, a two-pronged battle plan for the Pacific was developed. General Douglas MacArthur commanded forces in the South Pacific that moved up the Solomons, across northern New Guinea, and toward the Philippines. Admiral Nimitz directed a Central Pacific campaign that started in November 1943 with Army and Marine forces invading the Gilbert Islands. From here, the line of advance would be through the Marshall, Caroline, and Mariana Islands, again targeting the Philippines. By the beginning of 1944, these two forces had reduced the Japanese defense perimeter by approximately 30%. By mid-1945, the Japanese defense perimeter had been virtually stripped away. American forces had recaptured the Philippines and taken control of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, neighboring islands to Japan. Land-based bombers were routinely flying missions over Japan, and plans were being made for an invasion of the Japanese islands. As the final stages of the Pacific War were unfolding, President Roosevelt died on April 2, 1945, and was succeeded by President Harry S. Truman. The war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945, enabling the Allied forces to start redirecting men and material to the Pacific. In this final March to Japan, military casualties on both sides were continuing to mount, and military technology in the form of the Manhattan Project, conceived to develop the atomic bomb, had advanced. In an attempt to force Japan to end the war, the world's first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and Japan surrendered. On September 2, 1945, Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur accepted Japan's unconditional surrender from Emperor Hirohito. The war with Japan had started with an attack on American battleships in Pearl Harbor and ended on the deck of a U.S. battleship, the USS Missouri, in Tokyo Bay.